The subject for this episode is the attention economy. You know, we live in a world where almost anything we can make is being made cheaper and more abundantly. Food, devices, services, shelter, transportation, all the things that we create as a society is becoming cheaper and cheaper, so we're making more and more of them. Of course, there's more people in the world, but even per capita, we are able to produce more and more things. And some people call this the, um, the abundant, the age of abundance, where we literally don't really have scarcities of much. Most of the things are in abundance. But in this world of abundance, particularly in the world of information in the non-material world, there is one scarcity. There's one remaining scarcity, which nothing we can do can increase it. It's just a fixed amount. And relative to the explosion of other things in our lives, that fixed amount seems to be smaller and smaller. And that fixed amount is the maximum 24 hours of our attention that we have. Our individual attentions, attention that you're giving to me right now, is limited. Even if you were to never sleep, you have only 24 hours and nothing you can do can increase that amount. There are some ways where we can kind of, kind of semi pay attention to a couple things at once. Maybe we can drive and pay attention to the road while we're listening to music. But in fact, to have our full bore attention really, we are limited in the amount and it's no more than 24 hours, no matter how rich or poor we are. So in this world of abundance, we have a scarcity of attention. And remarkably, a lot of the recent internet high tech advances kind of are being paid for and run by our attention. Of course, attention is what we transmit when we watch or pay attention to an advertisement. And that advertisement is what is paying for your WeChat, your Alibaba, your YouTube, anything that you're watching on a movie screen or on a screen itself is probably being paid for by your attention, which is limited. So we have this scarce resource which we give out to some things during the day, whether it's our work or our entertainment or our friends. And that scarce resource really is fundamentally the kind of the ultimate driver of a larger economy. Now, the curious thing is, is that having said that, in some ways, the most, one of the most valuable things that we have as individuals is our attention. We surrender it for very little. Many people have, have, have noted that when someone sends you a message, um, you are giving that message attention. And if it's really valuable, you're giving it away for free. You're, you, you're just, you, if someone puts something in front of your face, you read it. Or if someone sends you an email, you read it. If there's an, an ad in the middle of uh, something you're watching, you'll, you'll watch it. And you're doing that in some senses for free. You're not charging it, which is really odd because we think that that's the most valuable thing we have. And the whole advertising industry is all based around trying to win your attention by using design, by clever storytelling, by novelty and other ways to attract your attention and have you hold it for some amount of time. So they're taking the thing that's valuable from you and using it, and, and then the advertising agencies are selling your, that attention to someone selling a product somewhere. So I think that in the long run, that's not a very sustainable it's asymmetrical. It's not really a sustainable thing where the most valuable thing we have is we're giving it away. And I think that we're going to move into a world where we begin as individuals to charge for our attention. And so the way this would work at the low level is 
um, I or you would charge someone to watch an ad. So it's like, if you want me to watch your ad, you have to pay me. Maybe not very much, but even today, right now, the attention that you're giving away, somebody is selling it for only two or three dollars an hour. That's the basic rate of what television and even the online world is charging other people for your attention. So your attention is only earning two or three dollars an hour in the total economy. It's very, very cheap. And again, it's remarkable for anybody living in the Western world that we're surrendering our attention for that little. But even that little, we should be charging for. And we may want to charge more. So we may say to advertisers, um, yes, I will watch your, web, your ad, but you have to pay me so much money. And that's actually in happening a little bit in this world of influencers. If you think about influencers, what's happening is basically a branding company, a company who has a brand, instead of paying an advertiser a bunch of money, millions of dollars, to make an ad, hoping that somebody influential would read it or watch it and then buy their stuff or talk about their stuff, they now send the money directly to the influencer, giving them directly money and having them talk about it or share it or buy it or, or, and share it with their friends. So there's a disintermediation happening where the advertisers are sort of being bypassed directly to the influencers, directly to the consumers themselves. In a certain sense, this is sort of like decentralized advertising where the money for the advertising is not going through the advertising agency centralized, it's going directly to consumers, particularly those that are more influential. And so they're kind of, in a certain sense, an influencer is being paid for their attention. So we're going to see more of this as uh, people who are trying to sell things understand that they can pay directly for the attention rather than going through an ad. At the same time, I think we'll also see the advertising industry itself decentralize, where perhaps an ad could become viral and spread virally, and people who are posting it might get paid themselves some of the revenue of people watching that ad, rather than just a publisher. So right now, the way, the way a magazine would work, or a newspaper, or a TV show is that they find the audience, which they deliver to the advertiser, the advertiser pays them for the ad. But what if you're just an ordinary person? You might be able to run an ad, like a magazine or, or a TV show could, and if people are watching that ad, maybe, maybe you get a little bit of money for running an ad that you didn't make, that someone else made, but you were running because you think this ad is cool and might make some money. So this kind of decentralized advertising which was also kind of started by Google. They had a program called Google AdSense, which were still ads, or sometimes they're animated, that could be run on any blog or any website in the world. So if you wanted to, and I did as an individual, I would run a few ads on my site, and those ads would be, um, I would get uh, some money if anybody clicked on them. But I didn't have much choice about what those ads were. So to kind of complete this thing, you would have to have a way in which you could just decide you, you saw a cool ad somewhere and you wanted to run it. You're just going to run all the cool ads. You'd be curating advertisements and therefore curating attention. So even individuals in a very decentralized way could curate advertising and get some revenue for doing that. And so um, this is kind of uh, an aversion or an extreme version where we're going to crowdsource advertising hasn't happened yet, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. And I'm suggesting that I think it probably will at some point um, that will take this system of people making, uh, companies making ads for others and will allow anybody to run it. And if they do run it and someone clicks on it or watches it, they, you get some kind of affiliate revenue. And um, but more importantly, you as an individual can curate, you can choose which ads you want to run. 
The old systems didn't allow you to do that, but that's what would be different in this one. So, um, in this world of scarce attention, with abundance not just of things, but we have an abundance of things to give our attention to. We have more and more songs created every year, more and more movies created every year, more and more websites, more and more new products. And if we have such limited attention, how do we, how do we view it all? How do we see it all? How do we find the good stuff for us? So this problem, again, is, is a problem that's not going to go away. And, it, and, and in particular, because we now have the ability to, again, disintermediate, to take away the middle people, we can go directly to the artist. We can go directly to the musician and get the material from them. We can go directly to the author and have the author sell us his or her book directly to us. We don't need the middle person. We don't need the publisher. We don't need the bookstore. That's true, but how do we find anything? How, how do we know about that author? How do we give them our attention? And how does the author find our attention? And that is the problem that will not go away. It will only get more and more challenging as we make more stuff. And we have some ways, the old ways, where the gatekeepers, we call them, where the publishers and the studios and the record labels themselves acted as kind of gateways. They would do the selection. They would say, we're going to hire this person or have a contract with this one because their quality is high, because they're really good, because you're really going to like it. And if you liked all the other things we made, you'll like this one. And if we go around them and, and cut them out of the process, we don't have that benefit of the curation that they were doing. We also have critics and, and reviewers, the book reviewers, the music reviewers, the movie reviewers, who themselves were deciding they would go see all the movies and they would say, this is the one that you want to see. And they don't have the same platform that they used to because they used to be on um, newspapers and magazines. Um, and they were just part of the mix that we got when we paid for those subscriptions. But as those institutions and those magazines have fallen away because of lack of a business model, it's really hard for a book reviewer or a movie critic to survive just on their own work. We haven't been able to see that, that happen, so they don't seem to be in the picture anymore. And to be honest, it was very difficult even for them to do the job. So now we have these algorithms in Amazon and Netflix that help us kind of curate things by using the data of our own watching habits, our own reading habits, and the habits of others to collectively derive a recommendation algorithmically and to give us those suggestions. And they are very effective. Amazon has stated many times that they, that a very large portion of their profits come from things that they have recommended to others. And Netflix does the same thing where a huge number of the amount of hours that people watch come from the movies and the, and the um, flicks that Netflix recommends that people watch next. And in YouTube, it's the same thing. The recommended things on the side are what drives up the hours that people spend watching the next thing. And so that is working. That's something that already does work and that will continue to work, but it's not sufficient. Part of the problem is that you have these reinforcing silos where you're just being recommended what you've already seen, so to speak, more like what you've seen. And so you see the same things. And we know from real life that oftentimes some of the best new things, excuse me, the best new stuff that we see are things that we had never seen before, that we did not, didn't even know that we liked. And that might come from a friend or a friend of a friend. And so part of this process of trying to manage our attention is coming up with better filters, better gateways, better recommendations, better curation, better ways to do that. And, um, Partly it's going to be based on what we have already seen. Partly is the new thing is in the social graph. It's using the experience and the history of the people that we are friends with. What have they seen that they've liked? And that becomes another recommendation for our attention. 
and that's becoming kind of effective, but it also has the same kind of problems of becoming ingrown, of becoming too sealed, too homogenous. Um, so we're learning that we want to inject oftentimes not something completely random, but something unexpected, out of the ordinary, not like what you've seen. And that's that little jolt, a little speck of the unexpected and surprising is an, turning out to be an essential element in how we do this. And again, there are ways to be surprised in a positive way, in a negative way, and we are only kind of learning how to do that. But that also can be done through our social circle or through algorithms. And finally, um, there are, there's a way in which our attention um, can be directed or managed by a, a more active way, not just as a consumer, but by us making or doing things, by what we do rather than by what we consume. And in a certain sense, where we are directing our attention, our limited amount of attention, not so much in consuming, but in the creation of things. And so, ideally, what we like to do is have our attention directed where we are creating and making things, maybe even co-making, participating in the creation of things that we want. So this was somewhat the move to the customized world where your clothing, say, is something where you are having a say in the design of it or the color of it or the shape of it. And as those tools become easier to use, it won't be just that we're kind of taking something off the shelf, even whether it be music or, or text or movies, but that we have some role in the creation of it, that our, that our attention is directed not just into the, what we intake, but also into what we output, what we produce. And I think we have, I think the world is more interesting and fuller if we spend more time creating things and not just consuming them. And if we can redirect our attention into that direction, um, I think the things that we make ultimately can prove as satisfying, if not more satisfying, as the things that we consume. Even if they may not be the same quality, the satisfaction of our participation can exceed that of us consuming things. And so in this world of kind of managing our attention and the attention economy, um, more th the new tools will help us partake in the things, that, partake in creating the things that we consume. And I think that is really the, the best future of the attention economy that I can imagine.